For nearly two decades, a mathematical genius with delusions of single-handedly destroying industrial society planted or mailed powerful bombs to unsuspecting innocent victims. It was a spree of mayhem that killed three and wounded over two dozen. In the largest and most expensive investigation in FBI history, agents spent 17 years hunting for the elusive terrorist known as the Unabomber. The first bomb came in the spring of 1978. The damage it caused was minimal, but its impact would be enormous. With each new detonation, the bomber learned a little more about bombs, and law enforcement learned a little more about the man who sent them. Because its targets were universities and airlines, the FBI called him the Unabomber. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. Before we ever knew the name Ted Kaczynski, we knew we were dealing with a disgruntled genius. We just didn't know how smart or how angry he truly was, or how far he'd go. But while the Unabomber was carefully perfecting his bombs, we were refining our profile. It was all a matter of who would finish first. On May 25th, 1978, an engineering professor named Buckley Christ at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, appeared in the mailroom with a shoebox-sized parcel. Professor Christ was listed as the return addressee, and he didn't know the man it was addressed to. Campus security guard Terry Marker cracked, maybe it's a bomb. As bombs go, it wasn't much of one. It began a 20-year streak of violence that would stump the FBI and terrorize the nation. On November 15, 1979, American Airlines Flight 444 took off from Chicago, bound for Washington, D.C. As the Boeing 727 reached cruising altitude, the cabin filled with smoke. It was pandemonium. The plane was diverted to Dulles Airport in Virginia. A dozen people were treated for smoke inhalation. But for a faulty wire in the bomb, over a hundred people would have been killed. Bombing an airliner is a federal offense. The FBI was called in. FBI agent Chris Ronay examined the evidence of the airline bomb. It essentially was a wooden box that looked uh, to be hand uh, fashioned, handmade. We found that it contained a uh, barometric switch and uh, some other uh, initiating components, batteries, wires, and uh, a container for the explosive charge. The barometric switch would function when the pressure changed in the baggage compartment sufficiently to close the switch or allow the barometric switch to function and then actually detonate the bomb. The use of an altitude sensitive barometric switch told the FBI that they were dealing with a serious and smart bomber. Ronay began his inquiries with the Chicago police. He was looking for anything to compare to the airline device. At Northwestern University, a thorough search uncovered the existence of two minor and seemingly unrelated incidents at the university. In addition to learning of the device that injured Terry Marker, Ronay learned of another. On May 9, 1979, another bomb had gone off at Northwestern University, seriously injuring graduate student John Harris. Its design was nearly identical to the first one. But since they were both relatively minor incidents, authorities at the time didn't connect the two. 
dismissing those devices as amateurish pranks, the recovered debris was discarded. Working only from photographs, Chris Ronay concluded that all three bombs were the work of the same person. There were construction techniques, the way the wood was cut, the way it was put together, the markings on the wood, the way the tape was applied, that is evident in the photographs, was the same as in the previous cases. The pipe bombs placed inside wooden boxes were all made of ordinary components, screws and nails and smokeless powder and black tape. The components were homemade and sanded to render them untraceable. Certain components were not crafted as much as fondled and played with and looked at and you could see they were handled and shaped and reshaped. And it just struck me that somebody spent an awful lot of time on this bomb uh, enjoying putting it together. The FBI realized they were dealing with a serial bomber, one that was passionate about his craft. In the 1950s, a shy, highly intelligent boy from suburban Illinois named Ted Kaczynski skipped a grade in elementary school. He was an introvert, preferring to withdraw into his room to study, especially to study chemistry. He was a prodigy with genius level intelligence. His IQ topped 170. He entered Harvard at 16 and graduated in three years in 1962. In five years, he had received his doctorate from the University of Michigan. As an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley, Kaczynski was not a popular or outgoing professor. Practically no one got to know him. In 1969, he abruptly resigned. The social nature of his teaching position was too much for Ted. He just didn't seem to fit in. By 1971, Kaczynski had decided to drop out of society completely. He bought an acre and a half of land in a rural area just outside of Lincoln, Montana, 6,000 feet above the society he had come to despise. He built a tiny eight by 10 foot cabin with no electricity or running water. There he would sit by himself, reading and writing. One of the things Ted wrote was a 23 page essay raging against modern man's obsession with technological and scientific progress. Scientific research he wrote will inevitably result in the extinction of individual liberty. He sent a copy to his brother, David. David read it and stuck it in a trunk where it sat for a quarter of a century. In June of 1978, Ted Kaczynski took a time out from his cabin to take a job working for his brother at a foam cutting plant in Illinois. Ted's bizarre behavior became too much. His brother was forced to fire him. Ted, take it down. Ted had insulted a female co-worker who had refused his advances. Ted seethed and within a year moved back to his cabin in Montana, vowing never to see his family again. Trying to fit in as a social being was too frustrating for the introverted genius. Ted withdrew even more, believing modern man incapable of understanding him. He was starting to see civil society as an obstacle that needed to be overcome. In time, Ted became acclimated to his life with few luxuries. He took it upon himself to grow his own food and to be otherwise self-sufficient. He had few acquaintances, opting for his own company in the Montana wilds. Ted rarely made it into Lincoln. When he did, it was usually to bury his face in reference books in the small town library.
On May 3, 1980, Ted Kaczynski rode his homemade bike into Lincoln. He wasn't going to the library this time. Instead, he caught a bus for Helena and checked into the Helena Park Hotel for a brief stay. The next day, he headed west. Ted had urgent business that needed tending to. Percy Wood, the president of United Airlines, received a parcel at his suburban Chicago home on June 10th, 1980. A few days earlier, he received a letter from a stranger promising to mail him a book which the letter said had tremendous social significance. Wood placed the package on his kitchen counter. He opened and retrieved a book, Ice Brothers, by Sloan Wilson. Wood was puzzled. Why is this book socially significant? He opened the cover. Wood was nearly killed. The bomber had upped the ante considerably with his fourth and most powerful device yet. FBI and ATF bomb technicians poured over the scene. It was quickly identified as the work of the serial bomber. Each bomb so far had been a pipe bomb with similar construction and wiring. On this, the fourth bomb, the bomber had left a calling card. Punched into a piece of rubble were the letters FC. Certainly, the initials FC were put in these bombs to be found clearly protected in such a way that they would survive the blasts. Uh, it didn't make any sense to have it in there. It didn't function any, in any way. It served no purpose except to say, here's my, uh, my signature. Here's an identifying feature. The FBI could only speculate what FC meant. By this time, FBI investigators had already given him a name. He bombed universities and airlines. They called him Unibomb, UN for university and A for airline. Naming him was easy. Finding him would be much, much more difficult. In 1981, with FC their best clue yet, the FBI cross-referenced thousands of people with those initials. But the Unabomber was not sitting idle. In October, a package was found sitting in a building at the University of Utah. It was a pipe bomb. Fortunately, it was a dud. Investigators now had a device intact. Perhaps a component was traceable. It would take time to find out. The Unabomber remained busy. In the spring of 1982, a package meant for Professor Leroy Wood Berenson blew up instead in the hands of an academic assistant at Vanderbilt University. The bomb was made of the usual materials, with the initials FC on the surviving wreckage. Examiners spent endless hours studying every minute detail of the Unibomb devices. The most bizarre clue suddenly emerged. The last two people specifically targeted were named Wood. Wood played such an important role in every one of the bombs. I mean, it was present in every one of the bombs, even when it didn't need to be. He, in fact, if, if he didn't have wood and he threw wood in it, sticks of wood just so they'd be there. There were references to wood in addresses and names of people throughout. FBI lab examiner Doug Diedrich of the Trace Evidence Unit is also a wood expert. Well, the materials may indicate something about that individual, may indicate where he might live, 
what he might do for a living. And that's one of the things that I was involved with, especially in trying to determine where these types of woods came from, uh, what geographical area, what part of the country. This approach seemed like a long shot, but the scarcity of clues left investigators with few options. As the FBI investigation intensified, so did the power of the Unabomber's devices. On July 2nd, 1982, Professor Diogenes Angelakos of the University of California, Berkeley, a devoted husband and a popular teacher, noticed a strange looking object on the floor of the computer science department's coffee room. The explosion seriously wounded him and tore off his fingers. As he lay dazed, he found a typewritten note. Woo, it works. I told you it would. RV. The FBI ran down everyone in America named Wu, and everyone with the initials RV, a monumental, labor-intensive task, but to no avail. The note was a ruse. Another lead surfaced the day following the blast. A custodian who worked in Corey Hall, the building where the bomb exploded, saw a man with a thin mustache and sweatshirt loitering in the hall the night before. The custodian, however, was unable to remember enough details to help a sketch artist make a composite. Angelakos was critically wounded, requiring a lengthy hospital stay. He was no longer able to care for his invalid wife. She died within a month of the blast. In May of 1985, in that same building, Berkeley graduate student John Hauser, a captain in the Air Force, noticed on the floor a three-ring binder sitting on top of another object. Hauser had just applied for astronaut training. What he didn't know as he lay wounded was that he had already been accepted into the program but he would never fly again. His Air Force Academy ring was found embedded in the wall across the room. Ironically, Professor Angelakos was nearby when the bomb exploded. He rushed to help Hauser. Unabomb-related crime scene investigations conducted by the FBI, ATF, and the United States Postal Service had become frustratingly routine. The recovered bomb components were packaged and sent to the FBI lab for future comparisons. Over the next few years, there would be many such examinations. On May 8, 1985, a package was received at the Boeing Corporation in Auburn, Washington. It was addressed only to the company, was heavy, and had too much postage. Hey, Mark, look at this. A suspicious mailroom employee called security. The package was x-rayed and shown to contain a pipe bomb. It had FC stamped into the end caps. Had the employee opened the package, it most likely would have killed him and anyone else nearby. On November 15, 1985, Dr. James McConnell, a psychology professor at the University of Michigan, received a letter and package from a Ralph C. Kloppenberg. The sender described himself as a doctoral student. I'd like you to read this book, he wrote. Everyone in your position should read this book. As he read, his assistant opened the package nearby. The explosion seriously injured the assistant and blew out the hearing of Dr. McConnell. Examiners continued to dissect the bombs. They were evolving as the Unabomber refined his craft. 
exhaustive lab tests showed they were getting more sophisticated and more powerful. Agents were frustrated. They were making little progress in determining the identity of the Unabomber. And their analysis was confirming what they already knew. If the packages kept coming, it would only be a matter of time before someone was killed. Hugh Scrutton owned the Rentec computer store in Sacramento, California. On December 11, 1985, about lunchtime, Scrutton headed out the back door that led to the rear parking lot when he noticed something. It looked like a block of wood with four nails sticking out points up. The explosion was ferocious blowing a massive gaping hole into Scrutton's chest, exposing his heart. The Unabomb was now a murderer. The bomb that killed Hugh Scrutton was the most powerful yet. It consisted of a pipe within a pipe and contained all of the same characteristics as the others, right down to the FC stamped on a surviving end cap. The Unabomber investigation was now officially a homicide case. Investigators stuck to their strategy of keeping the details of the case secret, lest the Unabomber learn what they knew, or worse, lest they encourage copycats. Agents were desperate for a solid lead. Ted Kaczynski was always active in his secluded cabin. When he wasn't making bombs, he was writing his philosophy that justified them. For Ted Kaczynski, technological society was a horror, defined by the Earth's destruction and human beings amounting to little more than mindless robots. In Ted's story, anyone who was participating in the human race's dependency on technology was a villain. On February 20th, 1987, a secretary at Cam's computer store in Salt Lake City looked out of her office window and caught a glimpse of a man in the parking lot placing an object on the ground. An hour later, the store's owner, Gary Wright, was in the parking lot. He noticed the object on the ground. It was a block of wood with four nails sticking out, points up. Wright received serious injuries, but miraculously survived. As police scoured bus stations and local businesses looking for a suspect, a sketch was commissioned from the secretary's description. It was unquestionably the portrait of a man in disguise. The sketch didn't catch the Unabomber, but in one way it may have worked. Knowing he was seen, the Unabomber seemed to vanish. After nine years of bombings, Unabomber-related incidents simply stopped after the 1987 CAMS explosion. The investigation had continued, but all available leads had been exhausted. After six years of silence, investigators were hopeful that the Unabomber had either been imprisoned on some unrelated charge or died. Either way, the bombs had stopped. But Ted Kaczynski was neither dead nor in jail. He had spent the last six years virtually alone. Content in his day-to-day -day routine. Tending the garden, hunting, writing, and visiting the library, Ted always managed to stay on top of current events. In 1993, after a six-year hiatus, Several highly publicized events propelled the Unabomber out of retirement. The fiery siege at Waco, Texas, between the ATF and the Branch Davidian religious cult, and the bombing of the World Trade Center created a violent political environment. The Unabomber would return in a fit of violence of his own.
Dr. Charles Epstein is a renowned geneticist at the University of San Francisco. On June 22nd, 1993, he sat down at his kitchen table to open his mail, including a padded envelope which had arrived that day. The blast critically injured Dr. Epstein. After two and a half hours of surgery, he was stabilized and very lucky to be alive. Two days later, on June 24th, Dr. David Galerter, a prominent computer scientist at Yale University, arrived early at his office to open his mail from the previous day. Injured in his right arm, help. eye, and abdomen, Galerter struggled to his feet and went out the door for help. The FBI quickly determined that the Epstein bomb and the Galerter bomb were identical. Pipe bombs filled with potassium chlorate and aluminum powder. Both devices had been placed inside a handcrafted wooden box. A few hours after the Galerter bomb went off, a letter was received in the mailroom of the New York Times. It was from a self-proclaimed anarchist group called FC, who were claiming responsibility for the recent bombings. FC promised more communications in the future, an identifying number was provided to the Times to ensure the authenticity of future communications. It was 553-25-4394. The FBI determined that the number was a social security number of a 20-year-old parolee in Northern California, incredibly with a tattoo on his arm reading pure wood. An investigation quickly dismissed him as the uniform. Another major clue was discovered. Impressed into the paper on the New York Times letter was the faint notation, call Nathan R, Wednesday, 7 p.m. The elusive Unabomber finally provided agents with a solid lead. The FBI talked to over 10,000 people whose first name was Nathan and whose last name began with R. The exhaustive search turned up nothing. It seemed the Unabomber loved sending the FBI on wild goose chases. The Times ran the letter, which sparked public interest. It also drew the FBI into dozens of false leads. Disgruntled students, aircraft engineers, even a Dungeons and Dragons club in Chicago. The latest round of activity had sent the FBI investigation into overdrive. A Unabomb task force consisting of FBI, ATF, and postal inspectors was formed to coordinate investigative efforts. Jim Freeman was the head of the FBI's San Francisco field office. He would also head the multi-agency Unabomb task force. We had evidence that was scattered around three different federal agencies and a lot of local state uh, laboratories. So we recognized that uh, our task was to, was to gain control of the information that was already out there, determine what investigation had already been, been done. And we set about this by deciding to reinvestigate every Unabom crime. Every shred of physical evidence that remained from past Unabomber devices would be given to one forensic examiner. Special Agent Tom Monell of the FBI Laboratory's Materials and Devices Unit became the chief examiner for the investigation. All the evidence in the Unabomb case, no matter if it was explosive related or not, came through me and my unit. In a serial bombing type case such as the Unabomb case, the most frustrating aspect was the fact that we were doing all forensic examinations that could possibly be done to the evidence and it wasn't able to lead us to any individual. While the task force struggled, Kaczynski's warped revolution against society continued. On December 10, 1994, 
advertising executive Thomas Moser was opening his mail in his North Caldwell, New Jersey home. His wife and two daughters were upstairs. He examined a small package with excessive postage from an H.C. Wickle, Department of Economics, San Francisco State University. The explosion was the most gruesome yet, instantly decapitating Thomas Moser. With every previous device in the Unabomber investigation, Agent Monell was able to reconstruct a replica, working only from the debris recovered from the various crime scenes. Signature of the As with the 15 bombs he had reconstructed, this one was unquestionably the work of the Unabomber. A few months later, Ted Kaczynski prepared for an extended visit to the West Coast. This trip would be his busiest to date. On April 19, 1995, Ted Kaczynski was in the San Francisco Bay Area when Timothy McVeigh's 2,000-pound fuel oil bomb destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people. Ted would not let his agenda be eclipsed by the devastation in Oklahoma. The next day, April 20th, the nation still reeling over Oklahoma City, Kaczynski mailed five items four letters, and a parcel. Within a few days, the mail arrived back east. First was a letter to the New York Times. FBI Special Agent Terry Turchie was second in command of the Unabomb Task Force. In the letter to the New York Times, he mentioned that uh, he was claiming responsibility for the attacks on Thomas Moser, Charles Epstein, and David Galerter. He also mentioned some of his uh, goals and objectives and said that he was thinking of sending a manuscript or an essay and that he wanted them to consider publishing that essay. And if they did, he would make an agreement to cease committing terrorist acts. The second letter received was to recent victim David Galerter at Yale, still recovering from his April wounding. The letter was taunting. Dr. Galerter. People with advanced degrees are not as smart as they think they are. If you'd had any brains, you would have realized that there are a lot of people out there who resent bitterly the way techno nerds like you are changing the world. On April 25, 1995, a package arrived at the California Forestry Association addressed to its former president, William Dennison. Its current president, Gilbert Murray, decided to open it himself. It exploded with incredible violence, destroying everything in the office. Gil Murray was literally blown to pieces. Four blocks away, the governor of California heard the blast from his office. The Unabom scare was nationwide. Bomb threats were being reported everywhere. The FBI suspect list topped 50,000 names. 16 years and 16 bombs later, the Unabomber had claimed three lives and injured two dozen people. Two months after Murray was brutally killed, a letter arrived at the San Francisco Chronicle. It read, the terrorist group FC called Unabom by the FBI is planning to blow up an airliner out of Los Angeles International Airport during the next six days. The threat had to be taken absolutely seriously because the Unabomber had in fact placed a, a bomb aboard an aircraft before. It wasn't lethal enough to blow the plane out of the sky, but we knew that, that his bomb making ability had progressed enough that he certainly was capable of that now. The FBI saw to it that special security measures went into effect immediately at California airports. No one without a ticket was allowed through security. All bags were searched. Bomb-sniffing dogs checked everything. The Postal Service stopped flying the mail on commercial jets. Passengers are questioned about carry-on luggage that they've had. Uh, have you had this package in your custody and control during the entire time? Uh, did, you pa did you pack the uh, suitcase yourself? Those type of questions all began from that day in LAX. The same day that the airliner threat was received at the San Francisco Chronicle, 
the Washington Post received a message from FC, a 56-page typed manifesto. The New York Times received a carbon copy of the manifesto the next day, as did the adult magazine Penthouse two days after that. The letter to the Post and Times laid out the terms and conditions for publication and agreed to stop the bombings if the Post or the Times published. For Special Agent Terry Turchi and the Unibomb Task Force, receiving the manifesto was a huge break. Of course, when the Unibomb manuscript came in, that was big information, and this was a, a major break, and we all knew that it was a major break, which, if handled properly, could possibly lead us to identify the Unabomber. The manuscript, blandly titled Industrial Society and Its Consequences, was a meticulously written tract against technology, genetics, leftism, conservatism, and modern society generally. The FBI had many items of evidence collected from years of investigating this case. They needed to generate just one solid lead, one that could hopefully break the case wide open. Freeman thought the answer lay in publishing the manifesto. We very much were in favor of, of publishing it because after reading the manifesto, it was clear that someone had, uh, had put their philosophy that had evolved over a number of years within the pages of this thing. Uh, it was recognizable. Somebody in reading this, we hoped, would, would read it and say, I remember that guy. He was uh, sat next to me in class uh, at uh, such and such a university. After some public soul searching and discussions with the director of the FBI and Attorney General Janet Reno, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, the decision was made to publish the manifesto. The manifesto appeared in a special section of the Post on September 19, 1995. By early 1996, Ted Kaczynski's brother David had been doing some soul searching of his own. The news reports that the Unabomber had connections to Chicago, their boyhood home, as well as to Berkeley and Salt Lake City, nagged at him. He got a copy of the manifesto and began reading. He read it in the hopes of erasing the idea that his brother was a killer. What he read sent chills down his spine. He recognized the language and content of the manifesto as being similar to that of writings by his brother Ted. David dug up as many old letters and writings of Ted's as he could find and compared them to the Unabomber manifesto. Both had employed the unique phrase cool-headed logician. David was distressed, but not yet convinced. He wrote Ted an urgent letter. Though he did not reveal his suspicions, he requested a visit to Montana. Ted refused his brother's request. David decided to call a private investigator to look into the matter but the news that the private eye brought him was not encouraging. The private eye submitted the manifesto along with some of Ted's writing to be analyzed by experts who didn't know the parties involved. The experts concluded that the authors had a strong chance of being the same person. Frantically, David continued his search for anything Ted had ever written to him. In an old trunk, he came across the essay Ted had sent him back in 1971. David could no longer hide from the reality that his brother might be the Unabomber. David Kaczynski was stunned. The 1971 essay David had unearthed was eerily similar to the Unabomber manifesto. Torn by the prospect of turning in his own brother on the one hand and endangering lives on the other, David Kaczynski made a gut-wrenching decision. Through his attorney, he contacted the FBI about his brother. In February of 1996, David Kaczynski told task force members of his suspicions. He gave a detailed accounting of Ted's life, where he grew up, where he went to school, and where he now lived. 
He then turned over the 1971 essay. And then we were able to do a side-by-side -side comparison between that document that uh, was prepared many years before to a, the current uh, copy of the manifesto, and it was uh, very clear to us, uh, many of us in the task force, that, that the similarities were more than coincidental. The FBI analyzed the essay and found over 160 examples of similarities with the Unabomber manifesto, including common phrases and misspellings. The list went on and on. After 17 years, the FBI had its first major suspect, Ted Kaczynski. Dozens of FBI agents quietly slipped into the small town of Lincoln, Montana. The FBI kept careful surveillance on Kaczynski's cabin as they laid out the case for a search warrant, hoping that the Unabomber would not strike again in the interim. By the beginning of April, enough information had been uncovered to justify the warrant. Among other things, agents were able to learn that Ted had traveled extensively. Hotel records showed that he was always on the move immediately preceding a Unabomber event. Agent Terry Turchie submitted a meticulous 65-page affidavit outlining the government's case against Ted Kaczynski and requesting permission to search his cabin. We had been working all morning since about 5 that morning to pre-position various agent teams in different locations in the woods in Lincoln, Montana, and at a forward command post that we had established in Lincoln. Everybody had a different role. We had also had the evidence response teams coming in, and they were staging at a, another command post that we had in Lincoln. So everyone was ready to go once the warrant was signed. Disguised FBI agents and a forest officer approached Kaczynski's cabin. They walked toward his cabin speaking loudly. They didn't want Kaczynski to suspect there was anybody sneaking up on him. The officers asked him to help identify a property line on their map. As he turned to get his coat, the officers pounced on Kaczynski. The suspected Unabomber was in custody. Kaczynski was immediately taken for questioning to a temporary forward command post. Jim Freeman was about to come face to face with the man that had eluded the FBI for nearly two decades. He looked just absolutely disheveled. Uh, he, he looked like he was covered with soot. Uh, the agents that had, had grabbed his arms to, uh, uh, to restrain him had soot on their hands. So Ted, do you like to travel? Kaczynski admitted nothing and refused to say whether the cabin had any live bombs in it. As the questioning continued, the search of the cabin began. The tiny cabin was treated essentially like a live bomb. It was assumed that the place at the very least had live bombs in it, or at worst, was heavily booby-trapped. Explosive ordnance disposal teams cautiously made their way into the cabin. Ted Kaczynski had not been formally arrested on any charges yet. As investigators searched through his cabin, they found enough evidence to charge him with possession of bomb-making materials. They found pipes, chemicals, wiring, batteries, and wooden boxes. This charge would allow agents to hold Kaczynski until a more thorough search could be conducted. FBI special agent and explosive expert Donald Sockleben was responsible for quickly gathering evidence in order to obtain the arrest warrant. He rushed to Helena to petition the judge. Sockleben had been working on the Unabomb case for years. I think it was on the ride back to Helena that night when Pat Webb and I, who had worked on this for so many years, just sort of looked at each other and realized that maybe this was the beginning of the end, uh, that we really did believe that night, if we hadn't believed before, that we had, in fact, caught the Unabomber. Ted Kaczynski was detained overnight until formal arrest charges could be brought the following morning. 
He was led through the streets on national television, looking every bit the part of an eccentric hermit. He was presented the next day before a judge in Helena on a charge of possession of bomb-making equipment. The search of the cabin continued. The room was a gold mine, but a dangerous one. Each container, each book, each binder needed to be x-rayed for explosive devices. It was clearly going to take a long time to search the tiny cabin. The evidence being slowly hauled out of the cabin was damning. A series of three ring binders with page after page of detailed bomb designs which matched the bombs used in many of the Unabomb explosions. Explosive powders of the type used in the bombings. Aluminum ingots and aluminum shavings on the floor, crucial bomb components. There was the infamous hooded sweatshirt and sunglasses. Agent Thomas Monell, the expert on Unabomb devices, was also inside the cabin. The other evidence located in the cabin were electrical components and wire that were consistent with the majority of the Unabomb devices. We found a improvised or a homemade flip type switch that was literally identical to three switches that were used in earlier bombs. After almost two full days, the search came to a sudden stop. A package was found. It was wrapped like previous bombs with a return address on it. All it awaited was a victim's name and address for the front. It was x-rayed and determined to be a live pipe bomb. Special Agent Sockleben had to handle the crisis. Well, from the x-ray, it looked very similar to the last bomb that had been placed the one that killed Mr. Murray in Sacramento. We were able to safely remove the box from the cabin and take it down the hill to where we set up a site to deal with the bomb. The search slowly continued in the days ahead, and more and more damning evidence was seized. In addition to bomb-making paraphernalia and chemicals, agents also seized letters, notes, diagrams, and the Unabomber Manifesto. One irrefutable link between Ted Kaczynski and the Unabomber remained, the typewriter used for the manifesto. The typewriter that had uh, been used to type the manifesto wasn't found until literally the last day of the search, which took four or five days. It was literally in the, la the bottom of the last box that was, uh, that was opened. It had taken 11 days to search an 80-square-foot room. But the FBI's careful approach had paid off. The man who had killed, maimed, and ruined lives, all the while taunting the FBI, was caught stone cold. On April 14th, the entire cabin was hoisted onto a flatbed and hauled away for further examination. The charges against Kaczynski had been upgraded. On June 18, 1996, Ted Kaczynski was indicted in Sacramento on 10 counts relating to Unabomber activities. One charge in the death of Hugh Scruton, three charges in the wounding of Charles Epstein, three charges in the maiming of David Gilerter, and three charges in the death of Gil Murray. That day would have been Gil Murray's 48th birthday. New Jersey authorities filed more charges for the death of Thomas Moser, on November 12, 1996, selected visitors filed into a Sacramento courtroom for the long-awaited trial of Ted Kaczynski. In the front row was Ted's family, brother David, and his mother, Wanda Kaczynski. As Ted entered the courtroom, he turned his back angrily on his family members and never acknowledged them. Opening statements were about to begin when Kaczynski stood up and said he wanted to change lawyers. After a few days, the judge ruled that Kaczynski would have to undergo psychological testing. Federal prison psychiatrist Dr. Sally Johnson spent many days with Kaczynski. She concluded that Ted Kaczynski was mentally ill, but was competent to stand trial. The government's case against Kaczynski was overwhelming. For 17 years, the Ice FBI brothers, had prepared for this day. 
examiners had reconstructed and preserved every device related to the Unabomber's crimes. With Ted Kaczynski's arrest, they were now able to establish an irrefutable link between him and the Unabomber. Ted's desire for solitude would no longer be self-imposed. With no options, he pled guilty to all Unabom-related crimes. He was given four life sentences plus 30 years. He would never be eligible for parole. For agent Terry Turchi, the Unibomb investigation shows the FBI's determination to never quit until justice is served, no matter how long it takes. For the people committing these crimes, who may go on for many years and not get caught, uh, they may become more arrogant, or they may become more complacent, or they may think we're never going to catch them. But I think for them and for the public, uh, the message has to be that we don't give up and that we're going to stay with it until we solve it. And uh, certainly I think that is what uh, we're called upon to do and what we need to do. In June 1998, Joanna Lee, an assistant editor at Simon & Schuster Publishing, received a letter from Ted Kaczynski with a prison return address. She knew he was the convicted Unabomber, but opened it anyway. Kaczynski wanted them to publish a book about his struggle. To this date, there are no takers.